Welcome to episode number 10 on our mini lecture series on understanding the war. And much like with the previous episode where we dealt with power, this one looks a little bit beyond the war and the types of instruments of power that can be used uh, in the 21st uh, century. And short introduction and actually 10 points, which means 10 instruments, uh, and then a conclusion. By way of introduction, last time we talked about hard power, soft power and smart power. And all of these 10 instruments that I'm going to talk about today are pretty much a combination of this. And my argument is that in today's world, everything can be either used as a weapon or as an instrument. And in many ways, for both good uh, and for bad. And there are multiple ways of using the 10 instruments that I am now going to outline for you uh, linked to the notion of power. Instrument number one is a classic one. It is military. Sorry to begin with that, but I thought it's quite useful. And in the military sphere, of course, we have conventional and non-conventional. So conventional being, you know, your tanks and your soldiers and your, your weapons and the non-conventional being the types of technological instruments that you can actually use. Now, uh, when it's about military power and the projection of power, a lot of it is about expenditure. So how much do you use in relation to your GDP? Uh, it's also about the size uh, of your military, whether it's in the air uh, or uh, the land, sea or space. Uh, and actually, it's about your capability, how you can use those instruments. But you know what? Military power is also about equipment. You know, if you have old equipment or old instruments, uh, you're going to be weak. It's about the quality of that. And at the end of the day, it's also about the experience uh, of your military. But this is more the conventional side. Then the non-conventional, modern side is that if you want to be strong, with your military, you're also going to have to have drones, you're going to have to have a good cyber and hybrid capability, and you're probably going to have to be good in things such as artificial intelligence uh, when you are using your military. So, instrument number one is military. Instrument number two is also a classic. It's the economy. But here I want to stress, it's not only about the size of your economy, your GDP or GDP per capita, or your competitiveness as an economy. What I'm trying to say here is that the economy, the things that were supposed to bring us together, can also drive us apart. So for instance, right now we can see that sanctions, export controls, and data regulation can be used as instruments of power, even, if you will, uh, as weapons. The same actually goes for currencies, for financial flows and reserves. We've seen this during the war uh, in Ukraine uh, when the dollar has showed its supremacy and the importance of financial flows have actually been used as a sanction in freezing uh, Russian assets uh, in foreign currencies and otherwise around the world. So the economy, including finance and monetary and fiscal, is an instrument of power. Number three, technology. And this is really a key, because if you have a competitive advantage in technology, you are going to be able to project instruments of power. And this is about artificial intelligence, it's about robotization and it's about uh, quantum computers. If you're not good at this, you're not going to have a strong instrument of power. I think it was Putin, by the way, who said that the one who controls the space of artificial intelligence is going to control the world. Or it was China that said that, you know, when a machine beat the master in a game Go, 
we need to start developing artificial intelligence. Or it's the European Union that says that we need to have benign AI. So what I'm saying is that you can use it as an instrument uh, of power. Technology also is about what kind of an infrastructure do you have? What kind of networks? 5G, for instance. How about raw materials? Do you have the stuff that needs to be used, for instance, in building semiconductors? Or it can also be about innovation. In other words, do you have enough R&D to be able to innovate in, in, in technology? Finally, I think technology as an instrument of power is also about data. A lot of people talk about it, you know, data being the new gold, the gold or, or the new oil. And here it's super interesting to see how you handle data. You have those countries that have a centralized system, like China. You have those which allow companies to be the data miners, so the United States. Or then those areas, like the European Union, that believes that data should be in the hand of individuals and, and privates. But what I'm saying here is that technology is a third and very important instrument of power. Number four, climate. Now, it doesn't sound like your traditional, if you will, uh, instrument of power, but think about it. It really is. So what kind of living conditions are you in? Are you in a hot and dry zone? Are you in a wet and cold zone? Uh, etc. etc. And on top of that is about your capacity to transition from dirty energy uh, to clean energy. So basically towards carbon neutrality. And here, uh, I think the winners are going to be the ones who can show that they are active and progressive in renewables, in innovation, and most probably transitioning in nuclear power. The losers are going to be the ones who stick to their stranded assets, CO2 emitting gas and oil, for instance. So if you have the curse of natural resources, and if you're born in a bad climate, you're not going to have a strong instrument of, of power. And here, really, it is about your capacity to, number one, legislate, uh, number two, innovate, and number three, finance. Not necessarily in that order. Instrument number five doesn't sound natural, but think about it. Geography. Now, geography is, of course, linked to climate. There's no question about that. Uh, it's not an instrument as such, but it is a reality. You know, what are your natural resources? What is your terrain? What is the climate that you're born into? All of that can be used as an instrument of power. Um, Russia has got the greatest natural resources in the world. Is it going to be able to use that geographic competitive advantage or not? That is the big uh, question. Geography is also about the capacity to generate wealth or the type of society that you're born into, uh, about your living conditions and really about security. Some parts of the world are simply not secure. People are born into a war zone. Take, for instance, the Middle East, which has an extremely complicated uh, and complex uh, history. It is not a competitive advantage to live in a country which doesn't have innate uh, security. So geography, I would argue, is the fifth uh, and important instrument of power. Number six, institutions. And here I talk about institutions which are both national and international. And by this I mean to say that nationally it's extremely important to have stable, resilient and functional institutions. Might sound awful, but bureaucracy is extremely important. If you have institutions, state-based or otherwise, that you can trust, that gives you a competitive advantage. At the same time, international institutions. If you are a part of the key international institutions in the world, you can use it as an instrument of power. How far are you willing to go in pooling sovereignty or creating alliances. I'll give you an example, a small country, say for instance Denmark, it's both in NATO and the European Union and of course the WTO 
and the IMF and the World Bank and the UN. It has a competitive advantage because it has strong institutions at home and it is part of strong institutions abroad. Instrument of power number seven, science. Never underestimate the importance of science, which of course is linked to all of the above. Uh, in other words, the economy, it's, it's linked to climate, it's, it's linked to, to, to uh, institutions, etc., etc. But science is the foundation of progress. And in order for you to be strong in science, you have to live in an open society with an open and curious mind and with institutions that support it. So you need to have a system which has both research and development, R&D, and therefore innovation. And that system needs to have a strong education system, second, primary and secondary. It needs to have strong universities and it needs to have strong resources. And science, when we start moving into a world where you combine biology with technology, through CRISPR technology and gene editing, the ones who can do these types of experiments and practice and open themselves up uh, to the wonders of science with some ethical limits are going to be the ones who have the strong uh, competitive advantage and strong instruments of power. Instrument of power number eight is information. And of course we've seen that for instance, during the war uh, in uh, Ukraine. So the one that controls the narrative can control the agenda. And of course, in today's world, it's very complex because information is moved around the globe in a nanosecond. And that means that there's also uh, disinformation and information which isn't factually checked moving around. And if I may, a little bit of a commercial break. Here at the European University Institute at the School of Transnational Governance, we have a wonderful center called the European Digital Media Observatory. What we basically do is Europe-wide fact-checking, fight against disinformation and improving media literacy. Whether it is about information circulated during COVID on, say, vaccinations or health ramifications, or the war in Ukraine, or what has happened on the ground and what hasn't. This is extremely important because you cannot have democracy without free speech and facts. You end up with an autocracy, basically with propaganda and disinformation. So information can be used as an instrument of power for both good and for bad. Point number nine on instruments of power, data. And data is super important, as I mentioned earlier. It is power. It's a valuable commodity that actually in today's world can be mined. It can be mined by states, it can be mined by companies, and it can be mined as individuals. And once again, information can be used as an instrument of power for good and for bad. So if you use it for good, uh, it's about learning things. It's about protecting individuals. It's about improving science. If you use it for bad, it's about surveillance. It's about control. So data is not an irrelevant instrument of power. Quite the contrary, it's the basis of a lot of power that we see in today's world. Now, instrument of power number 10 is a little bit outside the box. And you might be shaking your head, or if not that, at least smiling. I think lifestyle is an instrument of power. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the quality of life matters. The previous nine instruments of power are basically about creating the conditions for number 10. What kind of a lifestyle do you have? And I think the basis for a life of quality is about equal opportunity, it's about economic prosperity, and about social security. 
basically about an equal society where individuals are allowed not only freedom but also security and protection. In order for that to work you need to have a good system of education, you need to have stable institutions and you need to have a functioning system of rule of law. So let me conclude the ten instruments of power are military, economic, technology, climate, geography, institutions, science, information, data and lifestyle. All of these are hard power, soft power and smart power. And my argument today is that none of these will be driven or dominated by one player only. There's not going to be one country or player in this world that can dominate on all of these ten instruments of power. The key is for those who want to project power and be successful is to combine these ten instruments of power in a smart kind of a way. That was today's mini lecture on the instruments of power in the 21st century. Over the last 30 years,